truly very pleased to introduce Mr. Didet with his lecture tonight under the title Christian Missionaries in the World. Alhamdulillahi wahda. Wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'da. Allahumma ya mufattihu al-abwaab, wa ya musabibu al-asbaab, wa ya dalil al-hairin, tawakkaltu alayka ya rabbul alameen, wa ufawidu amri ilallah, inna allaha basirun bil-ibad. Auzu billahi minash shaytanir rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, wa lan tarda, anka al-yahudu, wa lan nasara, حتى تتبع ملتهم صدق الله صدق الله المرزيم I want to make a gesture You see I read to you an ayah from the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah That is chapter number 2 ayah number 120 But now I was just given the good news that a brother from South Africa, a non-Muslim is here in our midst, and he wants to embrace Islam. Now, I said, not now. Time is too valuable. We don't want to waste everybody's time while the process of making them read the Shahada and explaining all goes on. I said, let's get into the meeting. Afterwards, we can do the job. But now, let me say that if we wanted to tell him about this Surah Baqarah, and ayah number 120, how would he be able to find that reference in the Quran? If anybody can give me an easy way to explain to our new brother in faith how to find Baqarah, how to find Yasin, how to find Surah Talaq, how to find any reference in the Quran, how do you go about, what would you say? If the first person who gives the right answer, this Quran, this deluxe edition is his. Anybody? Yes, my brother. Hey? Right. This Quran is yours. The, at the end of the meeting, you can have it, Yahi. So, the way to find references in the Quran, more especially for the non Arab, I do not know. How easy it is for Arabs to find references in the Quran, I don't know. But for the non-Arab, very, very difficult. In an encyclopedia like the Quran, some say Surah Tawbah. Where will he find out of 114 surahs, Tawbah? Yasin, where will he find Yasin? Surah Talaq, where will he find Talaq? So at the back of this Quran, at the right at the end, there is a very comprehensive index. Just like a dictionary. What you want to know? Baqarah and the B. Baqarah. It tells you chapter 2. Tawbah. Where will you find Tawbah? And the T. Look for Tawbah. And you'll find this chapter 9. And so on and so on. Makes things easy for you. This Quran is available. I understand in the foyer outside. And you have a deluxe edition. And one without the gold. They are available there. As well as the literature. Booklets that I have written are available in the foyer. In the ayah I read to you, Allah Bari Ta'ala gives us an eternal reminder about the eternal relationship between us Muslims and the Jews and the Christians. He says, Walan Tarda, Ankal Yahudo, Walan Nasara, Hatta Tattabya Millatahum. That the Jews and the Christians, O oh Muslim, remember this that the Jews and the Christians will never, never be satisfied with you. Lan, Lan. Never, never, most certainly not be satisfied with you unless you become a Jew or unless you become a Christian. Never mind how much we bend backwards accepting all the Jewish prophets as our prophets without hesitation. We say that Hazrat Musa salam, was a Rasulullah, a messenger of God. Hazrat Dawud alayhi salam was a prophet of God. Hazrat Sulaiman alayhi salam was a prophet of God. Hazrat Isa alayhi salam was a prophet of God. We accept all the Jewish prophets as our prophets and all the heroes as our heroes. We are not talking about the modern ones. I'm talking about the biblical characters. We accept them all. Does that satisfy the Jews? Does it satisfy them? No. To the Christians we say, 
that we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe in his many miracles, including those of giving life to the dead by God's permission and of healing those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. We believe that Allah saved him from that ignoble death on the cross. Does that satisfy the Christians? Does it? No. So this is an eternal reminder. Either if you want peace, if we want peace, either we opt out of Islam, become Christians, or become Jews. Or bring them into the house of Islam. In the ayah, during the course of the introduction, another ayah was read by our chairman. Reading, Qul, say, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, Ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. For 1400 years, we are reading this ayah. Ta'ala, ta'ala, ta'ala. Ya ahl al-kitab, ta'ala. We are reading it in, the, in our homes. We read them in our masjids. But we have not invited the Jews and the Christians towards Islam. As a people, as a deliverer of this last and final revelation of God, this message, we have not asked the Jews and the Christians to come, that come, let us sit down and let us talk. We have stopped, stopped delivering this message. We haven't done our job. So now the Christian is doing the job. You don't invite him, he is now inviting you. And he is offering you his holy book, the Bible, in 2,000 different languages. 2,000 different languages of the world, this Bible is now obtainable. And he's offering it to you a pamphlet they give out to Muslims. It says here, a Christian gift, bakshish, gift, bakshish, free to all Muslims, not to Hindus, not to Jews, not to other Christians, but to Muslims, especially for Muslims. The Holy Bible, the Word of God. You beggars, he's treating us like beggars, you beggars, just fill the coupon and get it. For my Arab brothers alone, they have 11 different Arabic Bibles. Different Arabic Bibles. 11. So what do you want 11 different Arabic Bibles for? I understood that there is only one Arabic language. The language of the Quran. But now the Christians know better than me. And I don't know whether you know. That there are 11 different Arabic dialects. The Arabs, they don't write the same script. They have different scripts and different lahja, dialects. From a book printed by the Christians called the Gospel in Many Tongues. In it it says here, Arabic, the type of Arabic script that the Egyptians, Arabs and the Saudi Arabs they read. I maybe also it applies to the Qataris. Then there is a Tunisian script. The Tunisians, they have a different type of script. Arabic, but it's a different hand. Then they have Arabic Karshuni for the Syrians. They have Algerian Colloquial. They have Algerian Tunisian Mixture Colloquial. They have Egyptian Colloquial, street language of Egypt. In that language also, for the ordinary Felahin. They have Arabic Moorish Colloquial. They have the Palestinian. Then they have Southern Sudan Colloquial. And they have the Tunisian Colloquial. Eleven different Bibles for the Arabs alone. They have a special love for the Arabs. They love you specially. Here is a Christian publication called Pray. Pray. That's the title of the magazine called Pray. You see, when the Christian says pray, it doesn't mean pray. It means lift up your hands and make dua. Hmm? When they say pray, it means give money. That's the real prayer. Give. <laughs> Muslims. When you meet Muslims, you are in need of some help to do dawah. He said, make dua. So he quickly lifts up his hand. Say, may Allah give you 100 years life. And you know, all the blessings, everything. Because it cost him nothing. He is giving. One bank manager. I won't tell you which country. Muslim, Muslim. Bank manager. He was so happy with the work that we are doing. He says, you know, Mr. D. Dad, I want to give you the balance of my life. 
For example, if there's still five year balance for him before he can die, he's prepared to give me that five years and prepared to die straight away. So did that lose for five years more. <laughs> but he didn't give me one feel, not one halala. <laughs> that, is, that is how good, you know, the Muslim is for prayer. He's prepared to give his life. But he's not prepared to put his hands in his pocket. But when the Christian says pray, it means give and they give. You see here the picture of a Chinese or a Korean. His name given here is John Lee. He speaks about the kingdom of oil, meaning the oil rich countries, the kingdom of oil. And among so many other things, he says, I am in Saudi Arabia, just left Kuwait. He was in Kuwait, now he's in Saudi Arabia. What this enemy of God, what was he doing in Kuwait? What was he doing in Saudi Arabia? You know, it's a question we want to know. How did he get into Kuwait? How does he get into Saudi Arabia? Very easy, very easy. I don't have to explain to you. But very easy for these Mubashirs, these missionaries of Christianity. But now the, the Muslim, the Arab, he is very sensitive. In the age of the supermarkets and the hypermarkets, his, his feelings are also hyper, sensitive, the Arab. As soon as they say Kuwait, the Kuwaiti gets shaken up. He says, no, he's attacking me now. Any, I say Kuwait, he's the Kuwaiti says he's attacking me. If I say Saudi Arabia, the Saudi says he's attacking me now. I said, look, I'm only reading to you what this enemy of God, he is telling us that he has just left Kuwait and now he's in Saudi Arabia. This enemy of God, he says, I could think of no better or no more important time to give a lot of our attention to the Muslim world than now. Now is the time to pay a lot of our attention to the Muslim world. This is the time now. He continues, preparation is underway in Pakistan. For the last two years, we have been in contact with six key leaders in the Arab Muslim world to come up with a realistic and workable plan for every home crusade, door to door. Every home crusade. This year, we plan to open a research center in Beirut, Lebanon, to start the preparation for the entire Arab Muslim world. And he goes on and on, Arab Muslim world, and again, Muslim world, and again, Arab Muslim world. Is the Arab Muslim world that they are most interested in, the kingdom of oil. Here is the cover of a book. Cover of a book. The title is, Sound the Alarm from Saudi Arabia, written by Tom Griffith. This Tom Griffith was in Jeddah. He was in Taif. He was working among the Saudis for 10 years. He was studying the people while doing his job, whatever job he was doing. He was studying the Muslims. And now he has written a book, How to Work Among the Saudis, How to Pervert the Saudis. If you can't go door to door, and knock at the doors because the Saudis won't allow that. Maybe the Qataris won't allow that. Maybe the Kuwaitis won't allow that. Then how else can you work? There is a system. There is a way that they can get in without having to come and knock at your door. If you will not allow them to knock at your door, these missionaries, the post, post, postal department is there. Here is a letter. Is a photo stat of a letter. This envelope is addressed from Wolverhampton in England, addressed to the manager, Sand Supermarket, P.O. Box 7807, Sharafia, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Inside is a coupon offering you a free Injil in Arabic. Free Injil. Won't you like to have it? You beggars. That's how they're treating you. You beggars. Won't you like to have a free Injil? And out of curiosity, man can fill in the coupons and say, let's have a look. You're getting something for nothing. I haven't seen an Injil yet. Let's have it. And getting into your homes here in Saudi Arabia, maybe in Kuwait and maybe in Qatar. But this is the system that they're using. And Monte Carlo Radio. They're broadcasting. Day and night, they're broadcasting in Arabic. Reading the New Testament, the New Testament in 
in the Tilawatul Quran, like Abdul Samad Abdul Basit, Sheikh Abdul Samad Abdul Basit, tantalizing the people. These are new and new methods they have evolved to get their message to you. A small group of Christians, they do not number two million in the world today. They are sects and sects, denominations of Christianity. Among them, there is a group called Jehovah's Witnesses. They do not number two million in the world today. That little group published, among so many other things, only one book I'm referring to, 84 million copies of one book in 95 languages. 84 million. You hearing all right? I'm not exaggerating. This is from the magazine. 84 million copies in 95 languages. What language do you like to read? Akhi. Arabic, they got it for you. Zulu, they got it for you. Urdu, they got it for you. What language? In 95 different languages. And that book is not a booklet. It's not a little piece. This is 192 pages. 84 million copies in 95 languages. They have a magazine called The Watchtower. Buruj, Buruj, The Watchtower. This is just a cover. You open inside and they tell you that the average printing of this magazine, 13 million and 45,000 a month in 104 languages. 13 million and 45,000 a month in 104 different languages. We Muslims, the whole Muslim world put together with all our petrodollars, we can't produce a million sheets like this. With all our petrodollars, you can't produce a million sheets like this for Dawah. They are doing 13 million and 45,000 a month in 104 different languages. Another magazine, they call it Awake. Wake up. They want to wake up the world. Awake. They produce this magazine. Ten million six hundred ten thousand a month in 53 languages. Ten million a month in 53 languages. We can't produce a million sheets like this. All of our petrodollars put together in a year. A million sheets we can't produce. One family called Armstrong in America, Armstrong family. They publish a magazine, Four Color Job, The Plain Truth. 7.8 million a month, absolutely free of charge. 7.8 million. All this is like fairy tales. Wallah, it sounds like a fairy tale. You want to have a closer look? I don't know when you can come along and have a closer look. 7.8 million a month, absolutely free. And you can't pay for your own. Free! Professor Edward Said, a Palestinian Christian, residing in America. He's quite sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. This man, generally the Christian Arab, he's happy when the Jews knock hells into us. The Christians all over the world, they are very happy because at the back of the mind, Palestine was given by God to the Jews. From the Nile to the Euphrates, this enemy of God I've showed you, this Palestinian liberated Christian, he says, I can't understand my Arab brothers. You have million square mile of land. And you are grudging your Jewish cousins a, a few small piece. What is wrong with you people? God Almighty actually gave the Jews from the Nile to the Euphrates. And you mind that little piece that they want to occupy. What's wrong with you? Your cousins. Your Arab your cousins. This prof Professor Edward Said, he says, in the Time magazine, he says, early Christian polemicists, people who argue against Islam, want to debate against Islam, against Islam, use the Prophet's human person as their butt, something to hit at, accusing him of whoring, sedition, charlatanry. As writing about Islam and the Orient burgeoned, 60,000 books have been written against Islam between 1800 and 1950. 60,000 books have been written by the Christians against Islam since from 1800 to 1950. In the Newsweek magazine from America, we are told here, today, more than 60% of the world's 70,000 missionaries, crusaders of Christianity, not priests, ministers of the church, paid servants of the church, no, these are the mujahids of Christianity. 
out of the world's 70,000 missionaries, 60% are Americans. That is, worked out 42,000 American missionaries are raising the dust throughout the world. The methods, the methods that they use. Charming, beautiful methods to catch the unwary Muslim, the Muslim fish. You see, they have been studying us. They are our master psychologists. They are in the field. They study people, the customers. How to sell? How to sell? How to catch the fish? They study it. They look at the Muslims. That if a Muslim comes across anything written in Arabic, anything, in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Africa, anywhere, the Muslim child picks it up, kisses it, and puts it in the Quran. We are trained because the only thing we saw in Arabic is Allah's Kalam. So anything Arabic must be Allah's Kalam. We don't recognize the writing, what is there. This, what I'm picking up, my child is picking up, maybe Lady Chatterley's lover. You know, it's a book written, a filthy, dirty book in England. It was banned in my country for 20 years. It could be Lady Chatterley's lover in English. I'm sorry, in Arabic. You tear the pages and you throw it anywhere among Muslims in the world. The Muslim child and the grown-up will pick it up, will kiss it and put it in his pocket. So they find that this fish, the Muslim fish, they know what bait it will take. So they give you what you want. Here, look at this. Al-Kitab. Al-Kitab. Beautiful production. And Islamic calligraphy. You can't mistake it. This is Islamic calligraphy. Yes. You know what it is? It is Christianity. In the guise of this, you give it to the Muslim. <laughs> Mashallah. He's got something. <laughs> He's going to take it home. He's going to take it home and give it to his children. My child said, look, we got something beautiful, nothing. Catching Muslim fish. You know, I got caught. They caught me. I was in Pakistan, in Karachi, delivering a lecture. At the end of the lecture, people get enthusiastic. They want to pump your hand, you know. They want to shake your hand to show you how happy they are. They don't know that so many handshakes, you can kill me, you know, but now. It's your love, you want to show your love. They just want to touch me, you know, thinking some magic, you just touch me and you get blessed. However, while I, this thing is going on, a young boy, probably not more than 13, he comes to me and he hands me this. You all can't see it. Beautiful, beautiful. Sticker, stickers, shining stickers. And I glanced, it looked to me and I'm showing anybody, so what is this? And people say, Allah Muhammad. Have a look. Say, Allah Muhammad. So I saw, and I wanted to kiss it. But the people won't give me a chance. So I put it in my pocket and carried on shaking hands. From there, I go to Dubai. In my hotel, sitting on the bed, I said, let me clear my pocket. So I take it out, and I'm reading. Allah Muhammad, and something is a bit difficult. Beautiful calligraphies. Abbana in gold and black, Abbana, beautiful Islamic calligraphy. I'm thinking, Rabbana, this is the human mind. You get a little start, a cue, and you think, you imagine what is there, but it's not there. You're reading from your head. I say, Abbana, I say, Rabbana, Atina, fi dunya hasanatam, wa fil akhirati hasanatam, wa kena I go through the whole lot and I turn. I see at the back there, he says, the Lord's Prayer. I said, we don't talk like that. Lord's Prayer? What is this? This is the Christians talk like that. The Muslims do this. I told some Muslims, you know, I said, the Pakistanis, they did it. They beat me. I do produce some good literature. Wallah, good literature. But I said, the Pakistani beat me hands down. I didn't grudge them. Because in good works, Allah says, وَلِكُلُّمْ وِجْهَةٌ هُوَ مُوَلِّهَا فَاسْتَ بِكُلْ خَيْرَاتٍ Compete with one another in good works. I said, well, the Pakistanis have beaten me. Now mind, my brothers. But this is not Muslim. The Lord's Prayer, ah, now I can see. He says, O oh, our Father which art in heaven, in Arabic, Abbana. O oh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be the rest. Catching Muslim fish with this. 
With that, I caught an Arab sheikh in Saudi Arabia, an elderly man like myself, mature person, and I'm showing him this. So he says, I say, you look at the sheikh? He says, yes, Allah Muhammad. I say, yeah, sheikh, have another good look. He says, Allah Muhammad. I say, yeah, sheikh, have a good look. Then he says, Allah Muhabba. You can catch Arab sheikhs. What to think of the Bangladeshi and the Pakistani and the African Muslims and the Malaysians? This is how they catch Muslim fish. I said, a fair discussion is Islam encourages us. Ta'ala, come. Come, talk to us. Ya Ahlul Kitab, Ta'ala. Let's, let's come to a common platform. But now, this is deception of the highest order. Deceiving little children, deceiving the illiterate people to kiss the snakes in the grass and take them home. Now, that is something I can't stomach. Something I can't tolerate. Don't deceive people. Talk straight. He said, look, come here. I want to tell you that you Muslims are going to go to hell. You have no salvation. Salvation only comes with the blood of the Lord Jesus. All your fasting and prayer won't help you. Talk like that. I don't mind. I don't mind. It's a fair fight we can have. Fair discussion we can have. But don't deceive people. There was a time when Umm Kulsum was alive. She's dead now. Umm Kulsum. You heard the name Umm Kulsum? Sure. She used to sing on Cairo radio. Allah Muhabba, Allah Muhabba. And the whole of Egypt said, Allah Muhabba, Allah Muhabba. Look, Allah Ta'ala gives us in the Quran 99 attributes, his shifa, his qualities. But Muhabba is not one of them. But he's making every Egyptian, Muslim and Christian to sing. Because the woman sings so beautifully and everybody echoes, Allah Muhabba, Allah Muhabba. They did the job. They did it to us. Now, that was too small, small, small pieces. They want to help you, old people like me. See this? Beautiful, beautiful. Look at this. Very, very difficult for the bulk of the Muslims of the world to recognize what they're seeing. Catching every haji. Every haji comes for hajj, whether he's an Egyptian or a Qatari or anybody. In a hurry, you see this? I say, yes. How much? I say, real. I say, give me five. Give me ten. Give me fifty. I can mint five million riyals just like that with this Christian deception. Here is a publication, Christian publication, beautiful colored picture. It says, Christian witness among Muslims, Shahada. We were supposed to be doing the job. Allah says in the Holy Quran, لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِدًا عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَكُونُوا شُهَدَ عَلَى النَّاسِ as the Rasul was a witness to you, you, Watakunu, and the whole lot of you are to be the witness to mankind. We haven't done the job. We are not doing the job. So they are doing it. Christian witness among Muslims. And on the cover you see the picture of a Saud, I'm sorry, a Sudanese or a Ghanaian or a Nigerian with a subhi in his hand. You know, some of our brothers have. Subhanallah, Subhanallah, they read. Subhi. Hmm? And it's written here at the bottom, Inna Allah yubashiruki bi kalimatim minhu ismuhul masih hu isa ibn Maryama. What are you going to do now? Kiss it and put it with the Quran, a snake in the house. Here is another publication. Why I became a Christian by Sultan Muhammad Paul. Sultan Muhammad has now become Paul, a Pakistani gentleman. He's become Paul. You open the flip the pages you find verses of the Quran what do you do kiss it and put it next to the Quran you can't tear it you can't burn it you can't throw it we are trained for that Allah's Kalam we must respect so they catch you Quranic verses the only thing left for you to do now in the third world you know India Pakistan Bangladesh Africa kiss it and put it with the Quran another snake in the house where do these ideas come from? Where do they get it from? Somehow, they attribute this to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. In the Bible, in the Bible it says, Jesus is saying, Be ye as wise as serpents. Be clever like the snake. Be ye as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. I don't know what he meant. I have been wrecking my brains to find out, how can you be wise like a snake? 
you Ashraf al-Makhlukat, the Christians say that man is created in the image of God, you are like God in what your makeup, and you be wise like a snake, how can you be wise like a snake, poor snake, you know how wise it is? The snakes, you know how wise they are? 90% of the snakes of the world are, non, are non-poisonous. 90%! Out of every 100 you see, there's only about 10 out of 100, they can bite and kill you, harm you. 90% are absolutely harmless and they're needed. In this ecology, they are needed. But we kill each and every snake we see. And the poor snake doesn't say, say look, I'm non-poisonous, don't kill me, I'm your friend. I kill, I eat rats, I eat this, I eat, you know. I say, please, no, the poor thing, he's got no brains. You know, everyone gets killed, 100%, you see a snake, kill it. And 90% are harmless, poor things. See, But, I don't know, in the Bible it says that you, the, his followers, the Christians, must be as wise as serpents, clever like the snakes. This is really snaky business, as you can see. The way they are doing is exactly like a snake. But I don't know whether Jesus uttered those words. But it is there in their book. Here is another beautiful picture, four-color job. K. K. Alawi. Beautiful beard. Really well-sized, well-groomed. And Zulfa. Zulfa, you know, there's hair coming up to the shoulders. Our Nabi Karim Sallallahu used to have that. You know, hair coming up to the shoulders. With Zulfa. His name is K.K. Alawi. Muslim. Father Muslim, mother Muslim. Grandfather Muslim, grandmother Muslim. Great-grandfather Muslim, great-great-grandmother Muslim. Now he's a murtad. He's become a Christian. So, he speaks about in search of assurance. He's looking for assurance. Which, of course, he says he finds in Christ. But inside, you flip the pages. This is human habit. If somebody gave you this book, you just can't help doing like that. This is human nature. You must see what's inside. Whether there's any pictures inside there of some beauty queen or something. What is it? And you see verses of the Quran. What do you do? And put it next to the Quran. Another snake in the house. From Sufism to Christ. From Sufism to Christ. Free, free. They give you free. By John Abdul Subhan. Subhanallah. Abdul Subhan has become now John, John Abdul Subhan. He is now the Bishop of Pakistan. A Muslim who has become a Murtad. His father was a Muslim, his mother was a Muslim. His grandfather was a Muslim, his grandmother. <laughs> now he is a Bishop of Pakistan. John Abdul Subhan. Now he was calling you towards the Salib, towards the cross. You remember I said 60,000. John, uh, that, uh, our friend, uh, you know, our Palestinian brother, the Professor Edward Said, he didn't know about this. He is counting things gone by. These are all new ones. Share your faith with a Muslim. Jesus, more than a prophet. Your Muslim guest, our students going overseas, or expatriates looking for jobs in America, in England, they are your Muslim guests. The Christians, they are your guests. What a God sent opportunity to Christianize them. He said, you see, now, the Christian makes his mouth water. He is happy to see our children overseas, in their countries. They are happy to see the Pakistan and the Bangladeshis in America, in England, all over the place. The Arabs, all over the place. They said, you see, previously, if we wanted to preach our deen to them, we had to go to foreign lands. Now, we can work from a home base, sleep with the wife and children, and we can do the job, number one. Number two, when we went out to foreign lands, to India, or Pakistan, or Bangladesh, we had to learn the language of the native. We go to Indonesia, we must learn Indonesian. We go to Malaysia, you learn Malaysian. You go to Pakistan, you learn Urdu. Foreign languages they have to learn to preach to you. Now, he said, these people, they already learned our language, and they come to our country. So we don't have to learn even their language. E- making, God is making things easy for us. When we went to foreign lands, we had to accept their culture the backwardness. We had to go to their homes, sitting on the grass mat, b- flies buzzing, smoke from the kitchen, smarting your eyes, no more. Now these people, they live like us, culturally, sofa and chairs, you know, dining room sets, and this is now culturally also, they are prepared to receive the message. Yeah. 
previously. When we went to the motherlands, to their own countries, if we converted, perverted a Muslim into Christianity, he was in a minority. He stood out like a sore thumb. Everybody knows in, Qatar, in Doha that Habis, you know, he has turned away from Islam. Everybody will point a finger at him that that guy there, he's a murtad. That guy there is a murtad. No more. Now we can absorb him in a majority. 220 million people in America to have another Arab there or a Bangladeshi as a Christian, he gets easily absorbed. In England, 60 million there, it's as easy to absorb these people. They are not longer any sort of They are one in a majority in our country. Previously, the governments of those countries, they were not happy at us converting them. Now, man, they were helpless. Like Pakistan is a helpless nation. She can do nothing. If she starts saying, hey, no more missionaries, maybe the Americans will turn on the screw and say, no almonds for you. So the poor man, he doesn't like it, but he can't help it. He has allowed to these people to come in, make inroads into the territory. They're not happy, but they're helpless. But now our governments are happy to have these people absorbed into our culture and into our religion. Advantages after advantages they have against us. What is the answer to all this? Force of circumstances created the Islamic Propagation Center International in South Africa. Force of circumstances. It was not planned that we want to do such and such a job. Circumstances forcing us into situations. And as a result of that, we have reached a stage today that we are publishing books with that, beside the munaziras and the lectures, videotapes and cassettes. We are publishing books a hundred thousand at a time. This one here, we, so far, we have done more than 300,000 for free distribution. The title is, What the Bible Says About Muhammad Proving from the Christian Bible that our Nabi Karim was foretold. Basharat was given in the pre previous scriptures. And we give reference from the Quran. Allah says, Qul, tell them. Ara'aytum, Qul ara'aytum in kana. Qul ara'aytum in kana. In in the Allah. Wa kafartum bihi. Wa shahida shahidum min bani Israel ala mislihi. Says, can't you see whether this is from God or not, this Quran? And a witness from among the children of Israel. From the bani Israel, he bore witness of one like him. Wa shahida shahidum min bani Israel ala mislihi. Fa'amana wa stakbartum inna allaha la yahdi al-qawm al-zalimeen. He says, and they believed, but you are puffed up with pride. You don't want to accept. Now, we say Allah promised such a prophet that one life has one from among the Bani Israel. And we find this also in the Christian Bible. In the book of Deuteronomy. That is the fifth book of Moses. Chapter 18, verse 18. It says, in Arabic, our brother won't have to translate. <laughs> he says, Uqimu lahum nabiyam min wasati ikhwatihim mislaka. Mislaka, like you. Wajalu kalami fi famihi. Fayakallamuhum bi kulli mausihi bihi. وَيَكُونُ أَنَّ الْإِنسَانَ الَّذِي لَا يَسْمَوْ لِكَلَامِ يَتَكَلَّمُوا بِهِ بِإِسْمِ أَنَا أُطَالِبُهُ In English, it says, I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren, like unto thee, like you, O Musa, I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Verse 19, and it will come to pass, it's surely going to happen, that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he, that prophet, shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. In the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, God says, I will take revenge upon anybody who will not listen to that prophet. Now, this book is a tafsir, an interpretation of those verses. And they have been available free, but you can buy them tonight. Look, they had to be airlifted from Jeddah, and it's quite a costly business. In our own countries and around, if you write to us, we'll send you free. But don't kill us. Don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Let us survive. So, tonight, 13 of these in English are available, and 5 in Arabic, they are in batches. Arabic, these books are also translated into Arabic. They are available in the foyer outside. Here's another publication, Christ in Islam. What is the pos position of the Masih in the house of Islam? We printed these, 100,000 at a time, 
First print 100,000, second print 100,000, third print 50,000. So far, we have done quarter million over a period. Now, if I told you at the beginning that this beggar here has done more than 300,000 there, has done quarter million here, the Muslims said, no, you are lying. Is it possible Muslims doing quarter million books? I says, my dear brothers and my sisters, one little group, 84 million copies of one book and 95 languages, and that book is 192 pages. This is only a booklet. I did quarter million. Why shouldn't you believe me? If I wanted to put, add a million there, it's easy. Tell the printer, put a million, man, put five million there. No, no, wallah, we did quarter million so far. What is his name? The name of God Almighty. What is his name? To us, we know his name is Allah. But there are people whose name is Jehovah. Some say something else, something else, something else, something else. What is his name? So we go on to prove that in the language of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, the name for God Almighty is Allah. And this word Allah is in the Christian Bible. In every language of the world. In the 2000 languages, the word Allah is still there. They have not been able to change that. It's an amazing situation. The name Jehovah was not there in the original. In the New Testament, it's not there at all. But the name Allah in 2,000 different languages, it is still there. I said, you know you, my Christian brethren, you see it, you see the word, you utter the word, you hear the sound, and yet you don't catch it. As Allah says, You see it, you utter it, you hear it, and yet you still don't catch. Amazing. Now this book explains that. That how is it possible that a man sees, he reads, he hears the sound, and he still doesn't recognize that he's uttering the word Allah. Crucifixion or crucifixion. Very difficult to translate. Crucifixion or crucifixion. It sounds the same. What is this? You see, the first fiction in English is F-I-X-I-O-N, fiction, which means to fix a person on the cross and kill. The second fiction is F-I-C-T-I, and fiction means a fairy tale. And Allah tells in the Quran, zan. They only follow conjecture, guesswork, fiction. For the surety they killed him not. But Allah took him up to himself. This book deals with that subject. Is the Bible God's word? Is the Bible God's word? This Bible, is, is it Allah's kalam? This book deals with that. Now you master these little booklets. And wallah, I can assure you, there isn't a Christian born who can stand before you. These are the little pebbles that Hazrat Dawud picked up. You remember? The battle between the Bani Israel and the Palestinian has been going on for 3,000 years. It's nothing new. 3,000 years, you know, the battle is going on. And you read in the Bible that these Jews, when they went into Palestine, they destroyed them utterly. They killed men, women and children, even sucklings, little babies were not spared, and not even donkeys. The Bible tells you again and again, they destroyed them utterly. They go somewhere that destroyed them utterly, finished them up all for gold, wiped them out. At one stage in the history of this conflict, the Palestinians, they have in their midst a giant called Jalut. Goliath, an eight-foot giant. So they are on a hilltop, and on the opposite hill are the Bani Israel. And Jalut, because of his size, he is shouting, Say, hey, you Jews, is there anybody there who can take me on? I'll chew you alive. Come, come. And the Jews were shivering in their pants. I don't know whether they were wearing pants those days, but <laughs> figuratively, they shiver in their pants. <laughs> Nobody is prepared to take him on. Because if he just catches one of them, they will crush him, crush him. But little Dawood is somewhere around. What is he doing? He is looking after his father's sheep. He is a shepherd boy. He was no Rasul then, no Mess Nabi then. He was a shepherd boy, looking after his father's sheep. And he sees this Jalut and it makes his mouth water. Very tempting. I say, this guy here is a sitting duck. He is a sitting target for me. So he comes to Talut, Saul, and offers his services. Says, look, I can take him on. So what? You go look after your father's sheep, man. 
the young man, the young man is so enthusiastic. He says, "No, man, you don't know this fellow here. I can knock him out." That enthusiasm. So Talut Saul, he offers his sword and his shield. So look, take this. So little Dawood says, "Look, I haven't handled this in my life before, but I have my sling. Sling, a toy, a toy. You want to kill a giant with a toy? A bigger joke." It is a joke. You, when we veterans of so many wars, we are terrified to face this Jalut, and you, and now with a toy, he said, "Look, you just wait and watch. Give me permission." So Talut says, "All right, go." So he walks down the hill at the stream. He picks up a few pebbles, stones. He puts one in the pouch. That this sling with the rubber was not invented then. There was no rubber then. So he takes this pouch. With two strings, he puts a stone and he swings, wing, 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 and at the right moment he lets it go. He is a good marksman. He has been killing birds with it. He has been killing rabbits with it. He is a good marksman. That's his practice, pastime. And he swings and he lets go at the right moment, and the little stone strikes Jalut on the forehead, cracks his skull, and the giant falls. Little Dawood rushes up, takes his own sword, and chops off his head. So Allah says, "Wa katala Dawood o Jaluta, and Dawood kill Jalut. Wa ta hulahu mulka, and Allah gave him dominion, wal hikmata, and wisdom. Wa Allah muhum in Maisha, and whatever else he willed." Now, these little booklets are those stones to knock the Jalut's head, whether American Christian or British Christian or German Christians or whatever Christian, to crack his skull. بل نقذف بالحق على الباطل فإذا ما هو فازه وزاهك ولا كم الويل من ما تسيفون. These are those little stones. I want you to pick them up. You'll have to pay something. I don't know what. You'll have to pay the man there. He's outside. You pick up these stones and take them and master them. And I tell you, there isn't a Christian born who will be able to stand before you. وآخر الدعوان أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. Mr. Ahmad Bidar, what do you think about the ideal plan to lead the world to our way to Islam, of Islam, in this time? Have you, uh, have you some modern means for this? Uh, how are you, uh, how you represent to the Islamic invi uh, invica invocation in the future? You see, each and every group that you come across, you will have to develop systems of bringing them towards Islam. Allah gives us the secret of this in the ayah I read to you. Qul, ya ahl al-kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. Let us find some common denominator between ourselves and the other side. And there is no better way. And Allah is showing us in the Quran, like He's speaking, when He's speaking to the people, the Jews and the Christians. You see, the Jews and the Christians were boasting that we are the people of the book. We are a people with the scripture. You Arab, you haven't got a book to your credit before Islam. You haven't got a prophet to your credit you know, backward people, illiterate people. We are a learned people. We have a book, books, scriptures. So Allah Bari Taala addresses them. Say, Ya Halal Kitab, with such respect, O people of the book, La Taqlu Fi Dinikum. Say, Do not go to extremes in your religion. Walla Taqulu Ala Allah Illa Al Haq. But, and do not say anything about Allah except the truth. This is reasoning with them. They love to hear that we are a learned people, people with the scriptures, so Allah addresses them. The Jews were boasting that we are the chosen people. Allah drowned Fir'aun and his soldiers in his army in our very sight. Allah gave us clouds, shelter of clouds for 40 years. He gave us manna and salwa in the desert. So Allah Bari Ta'ala reminds them, Ya Bani Israel, askuru ni'mati allati anamtu alaykum. O oh, Bani Israel, O oh, children of Israel, remember the special favors which I did unto you. Wa anni faddal tukum ala alameen. That I preferred you above all the peoples of the earth for my special favors. So, 
Allah is showing us you speak to a people according to their own background and their own experience. There is no better way. And if we master, if we master a little of their background, you got to. Because otherwise there's no, you can't correlate. The man tells you that Christ died for your sins. He says, no, my Quran says, وَمَا قَتْلُهُ وَمَا سَلَبُهُ He said Christ died. You say he didn't die. So he's asking you, where did you get it? He says, from the Quran. He said, where did the Quran come from? So we said, look, Allah Bari Ta'ala, he revealed it to his Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he laughs, he says, what? That man, how many wives did he have? You know, he copied this book from the Jews and the Christians. You know, he spread his religion at the point of the sword. Now there is a war. But if you can correlate this now, let's have a look. Allah is telling you, he says, tell them, Qul hatu burhanakum. Anything the man claims. Anybody, whether Jew or Christian or Hindu, anybody makes any claim, Allah says, Kul hatu burhanakum. Tell them, where is your burhan, your proof, your certificate that entitles you to Jannah and destines us to Jahannam, hell. Let us have a look at your proof. Now this is the secret, which open secret, which you have not learned yet. You have to learn this. So the man says, here, it is in my book. So you deal with it. Wallah, it is so easy. These little booklets are teaching you, it's so easy. Once you handle his burhan, his proof, let's have a look what it says. And Wallah is not saying what he's telling you. He says, Jesus is God. He says, Jesus is God. We said, look, did he claim to be God? If there is any way in your book, I'm telling the Christians in mass meetings, any way in your book, in any version of the Bible, you have a dozen different versions. Any version of the Bible where Jesus says, I'm God, I said, I'm prepared to accept him as God. Where Jesus says, worship me, I'm prepared to worship him. Show me in your book, your Burhan. So he's asking me, you mean to say it's not there? I said, you show me. Because Allah shows in the, in the Quran that he never made any such claims. So it's such a fantastic way. Wallah, it is so easy and so pleasant. It's like a game of chess, intellectual chess. You are playing with him and you are always on top. Well, before I ask my question, I have to thank uh, the chairman and the, the man, that's uh, Brother Didat, who is actually organizing this. Just or second. trying to. Just one, I think if they remove that, you'll have a better contact with the mic. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Ghanaian, I have been actually looking or fighting to know the truth because I believe that we've all been dest destined to a life and after that we have to pay for whatever we do on this earth. And when I came here about a year now, I have been actually struggling and incidentally, I had a, an address, and I wrote to Saudi. And incidentally, all the pamphlets he mentioned, I've got all, and I read them all. But I got one or two questions to ask. And uh, that is first, it's on uh, who moved the stone. And in fact, I really enjoyed everything there. But the only thing which baffles me is, was it really that Christ died and his body was being removed from where he was placed because I couldn't just get that portion properly. So I'm very glad that the man who wrote it is he himself is here. He will enlighten me about that. The brother from Ghana is referring to this little stone. This one here. It says here, who moved the stone? You see, the Christian world is intrigued. For 2,000 years, they are worried. Who moved the stone? It's not the Kaaba stone. They say that Jesus Christ, after his alleged crucifixion, what they say that he was killed, and then he was given a burial bath, and he was put a shroud around him, and they put him into a sepulcher. A sepulcher is a cave-like thing. Big roomy chamber, which according to a Christian authority, Jim Bishop, he said it was five feet wide, by seven feet high, by 15 feet deep with a ledge of ledgers inside. 
And after the body was put inside, a big stone was put into place. Now, Sunday morning, first day of the week, according to the Christian scriptures, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. For what? She goes to anoint him, says the Bible. What is anoint? Anoint comes from the Hebrew word masaha, Arabic masaha, which means to rub, to massage, to anoint. That's what she went to do. So we are asking our Christian friends, do Jews massage dead bodies after three days? Do they? They said no. Do Christians massage dead bodies after three days? They said no. We Muslims, we are the closest to the Jew in our in our laws and regulations. Do Muslims massage dead bodies after three days? The answer is no. Then why would this Jewess want to go and massage a dead rotting body after three days? You know, within three hours, rigor mortis sets in, the hardening of the cells, the breaking of the cells. Three days time, the body starts fermenting from inside, rotting from inside. Such a rotting body, if you massage, it falls to pieces. Does it make sense that she's going to go and massage a dead rotting body? But she's worried. She is worried. He said, now how am I going to get to him? Because there's a stone there that was placed. When she goes there, she finds the stone is removed. She looks inside and she finds the winding sheet inside. She starts to cry. Disappointed. Who moved the stone? You know, it hasn't occurred to the Christians in 2,000 years. I'm asking, who put the stone in place? So it tells us, Joseph of Arimathea, one man, his secret disciple, put the stone in place. If one man can put a stone in place, then why can't two persons remove it, I'm asking. Common sense. But they think an angel came from heaven and an earthquake took place. I said, what's all these fairy tales? Look, if one man can put a thing in place, I said, who opened the door? So I'm asking, who closed the door? It's a well stone. It's a big door. If one man can close it, why can't two persons open it? As simple and easy as that has kept the Christians busy for 2,000 years. They're still wondering who moved the stone. I give the answer in this little pebble. Pebble. This little pebble. He is saying that the answer for this question, which was said, who put the stone, who removed the stone, he says he has the answer. And this has been mentioned in the Bible, uh, the Bible of Matta. He gave the pages 38 to 40, and he says this is very well known uh, that uh, Jesus Christ, he stayed one day and two nights, and then he was taken, or he was gone Sunday. Uh, he also says that Prophet Muhammad, it is known, that he stayed in the cave with Abu Bakr عنه, for three days. So he says, why did you not ask Swagart when you were talking to him about the many times that Prophet Muhammad was mentioned in the Bible? I don't see any connection whatsoever. You know, I'm amazed, I'm amazed. I don't know whether, you know, there's a saying that running with the hare and hunting with the hound. I just can't make out whether you are a fish or a fowl. You know, whether you are a Christian or a Muslim. What are you? Are you Muslim? You are a Muslim. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. <laughs> you see, in a debate, you are given certain amount of time. In a debate, any debate, you are given certain amount of time. 50 minutes here, 50 minutes there. 10 minutes there, 10 minutes there. That is a debate. Now, you can't sp start speaking about the whole world, about the whole Bible. Nobody can. You can't start touching each and everything. We had a debate with another Christian, Professor Clark, in the Royal Albert Hall. That was in reference to this, what you have read now. You see, the Jews came to Jesus, and they said, Ya mu'allimu nuridu an nara minka ayatan. Now you might think I know Arabic, and I don't know Arabic. <laughs> I learned this from the Arabic Bible, you see. Ya Mu'allimu, Matthew chapter 12, verses 38, 39, 40. So 
يا معلم نريد أن نرى منك آية فأجاب وقال لهم and he said جيلون شريرون وفاسقون يطلبوا آية it's an evil and adulterous generation seek it after the sign ولا توتا له آية but there shall no sign be given unto it إلا آية يونان النبي but the sign of the prophet Jonah لأنه كما كان يونانو في بطن الحوتي ثلاثة أيام وثلاثة ليالين for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale Hakaza just like that Hakaza يكون ابن الإنسان قلب الأرض ثلاثة أيام وثلاثة ليالين now when you analyze that when you analyze that, Jesus said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. No Christian on earth can justify three and three. Never. You see? And that is now this little, another pebble, another stone. You remember I told you the, doubt, the stone that Dawud Islam picked up? Yeah, this, this, this little 12 page. You get this, you master this, and I tell you, you can crack his skull. The Jalut, where the Swagat or Swagat's father. Uh, was it really that uh, Christ Jesus wasn't crucified? He never died? And how can we prove this? Because this is the only thing which is actually, <coughs> excuse me, protecting me or trying to retard my progress to become a Muslim. All my students, I'm sure some of them are here, they know of my ambition. But my aim and the truth is what I'm looking for. Because I believe. A day will come I must stand by the judgment throne to actually testify all what I've done on earth. But how am I going to find that truth? Because it has been told that we've, we, the Christian, believe that Christ died and rose to show to the world that after death there is life. This is the proof. But if I can just have that, hallelujah, I will turn tonight to be a Let Muslim. Me. I prove this to you. The brother said, now, if he can be made certain that this crucifixion didn't take place, he is prepared to accept Islam tonight. Let us see. Man says, I want to find the truth. But generally, they close their eyes, they say, I want to see the sun. And I don't see the sun because his eyes are closed. And he doesn't want to open the eyes. He's terrified to open the eyes. Nobody can help him. No million suns can help him to see the light if he keeps his eyes closed. But now, if he opens himself to say, let's have a look. What does the book say? The book says, Luke chapter 24, verse 36, that Jesus returns to that upper room where they had the Last Supper. The Christian knows what I'm talking about. Before his alleged crucifixion, Jesus went to that upper room in Jerusalem, and with his disciples, they had the Last Supper. So, after his alleged crucifixion, Jesus returns after three days. And he goes into this room, and his disciples are there. Ten of them. Ten of them are there. And he wishes them in Hebrew, Shalom Aleichum. Same as Salam Aleichum in Arabic. When he said, peace be unto you, Salam Aleichum, his disciples were terrified. So, I'm asking my Christian brothers, why were, he, why were they terrified? They were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. Am I quoting correctly your scripture? Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I'm asking, did he look like a spirit? Did he look like a ghost, a spook? They said no. Then I said, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't, didn't look like one? Christian gets puzzled. Because they say he, they thought that he was a spirit. So I said, you see, the reason is that the disciples of Jesus, his Hawariyun, they had heard from hearsay people talking that the master, Jesus, was hanged on the cross. They had heard from hearsay people talking that he had given up the ghost, you know, that his spirit had come out, he had died. They had heard from hearsay people talking that now he's dead and buried for three days. All the knowledge is from hearsay. People talking, because Mark chapter 14, verse 50, he tells us that at the most critical juncture in the life of Jesus, all his disciples forsook him and fled. All. 
So I'm asking, does all mean all in your language, you English man? He said, yes. So they were not there. All the knowledge from what they heard. So on hearsay knowledge, if you know about a man who is dead and buried for three days, you expect him to be stinking in his grave. Am I right? After three days, the man should be stinking in his grave. Such a person you see, naturally you are terrified. Because you think he's a spook, a ghost, a spirit. So Jesus wants to assure them that he's not what they are thinking. They are thinking he has come back from the dead, resurrected. So he says, Unzuru ila yadaya varijalaya. He says, Behold my hands and my feet. Inni anahua. I am the same fellow man. What's wrong with you fools? Can't you see? Inni, most certainly I, anahua. Husuni wanzuru. Say, Handle me and see. Fainna ruha laisa lahu lamu weizamun. For a spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. And they felt him. And they believed not for joy. Means they were overjoyed. And wondered, what happened man? We thought the man was dead and buried. So he says, to assure them further, that this is not what they are thinking, he says, Have you got here anything to eat? And they gave me a piece of broiled fish, and a honeycomb, and he took it, and he ate, in the very sight, to prove what? There is a ghost, he's a spook, he's a spirit. What is he proving? I am a same fellow man, damn fools, what are you afraid of me for? This is what he's proving to them. He's telling them that he's not what you are thinking. And yet he said, look, he is. He said he's not a spirit, you say he is. Amazing, amazing sense of logic reasoning. The man is telling you, I am not, you say he is. Jesus says, I am not God, I am a servant of God, you say, no, he's God. Jesus says, I don't know about the Yom Al-Qiyamah, they say, no, he knows. Jesus says, I can't do everything of my own self. He said, no, he can do everything. I said, what's wrong with you people? The man is telling you, I don't know. The man is telling you, I'm the same fellow. And you say, no, he's a spirit. He said, he's not a spirit. You say, he's a spirit. I want to know whether you understand English. I don't know Ghanaian. I thought I told you in the Ghanaian language. Okay? A spirit has no flesh and bones. Why does he tell you a spirit has no flesh and bones? Look, it's an axiomatic truth. Everybody agrees. Whether Hindu, Jew, atheist, agnostic, spirit has no flesh and bones. So why must he tell you that? Because you are thinking that he is. He said he is not that. And he's eating broiled fish and honeycomb. Do resurrected bodies eat broiled fish and honeycomb? Do they? That when we wake up, Yomul Kiyama, everybody eating broiled fish and honeycomb? Is that what it is? So what is this? The man is telling you he is not, and you say, no, he is. I said, this is this. The Quran discussed, Jesus said, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. The Quran confirms that, it's a summum bukmun umyun, for whom lai rji'un. Deaf, dumb and blind, they will not return to the path. If you want to see, the signs are there. This booklet is here. I don't know whether you got this, crucifixion or crucifixion. Have you got this? Yes. Now, look, man, the whole thing, there isn't a Christian born, look, brother, brother, listen. I'm, I'm offering your mighty Christian giants in America meeting in the Madison Square Garden at my expense. You get me Jerry Falwell or Pat Robertson or Billy Graham and I will give you, 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 $10,000 present. If you can make any one of those to agree to discuss this with me in America in Madison Square Garden, I will give you as a present $10,000. He asked two questions, but I believe it's the same question. First, he mentioned about the Palestinians and about uh, the sling and the stone, and he wished victory for them. Then he said, we thank Mr. Didat, how he showed us that the Christians using all means, crooked and everything else, and they are working as a group. So we are asking ourselves, we are asking Mr. Ahmed did that for a plan, a general plan to face those problems. He says that in one of the meetings, Zwemer, which was taking place in the 70s in, in the States, millions and millions, hundreds of millions were connected. Now, the Muslims have tried in the last three years to make 
the International Organization for, uh, for Serving the Muslims, let's say. For the last three years, they have not collected anything of importance. And he mentioned this verse, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, إِن تَأْنَمُونَ فَإِنَّهُمْ يَأْنَمُونَ إِن تَكُونُوا إِن تَكُونُوا تَأْنَمُونَ فَإِنَّهُمْ يَأْنَمُونَ وَتَرْجُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَرْجُونَ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن تكونوا تأنمون فإنهم يأنمون كما تأنمون وترجون من الله ما لا يرجون the, If we can try to, to say the meaning of this Now for the non-Muslims If we as Muslims are feeling difficulties and pain When they are in the same position And we expect from Allah more than they, than they do so why not be patient and not put the plan and start working? We are asking Mr. D. that for this and we want something uh, like a group, like a school. So the effort should not be individual. It should be something lasting and something that the others can share and the responsibility can be given on almost everybody. You see, brothers and sisters, our brother, he put quite a lengthy explanation. And from his explanation, though I didn't understand the Arabic, I can see that he is a very capable person. Very capable, well spoken, good personality. He is the man who should be giving the lead. To the people. So look, this is what is to be done. Instead of passing the buck, <laughs> passing the buck onto somebody else, you know, somebody must do this and somebody must do that. I say, you know who that somebody is? Is you. The one who speaks, he is the right man. But we are all cowards by nature. We want to pass on the responsibility to somebody else. I says, brother, you take it up. You have the right ideas. We, in our own little way, in my country, regarding the Palestinian problem, we started a movement. I don't know if you have received this already or not. You see, this one here. You see the picture of a Palestinian boy, child, being snatched away from the clutches of the Jews. And the mother, by the mother, is trying to save the child. And you see some girls with open mouths, gaping, terrified, looking on. When I saw that picture, it made me cry. There were other pictures I'd seen, atrocities, that made me angry. It's quite a different emotion. Anger is different from pity, sympathy, emotions. You break down, you cry. That's different from anger. This thing made me cry. Then here in this, on this pamphlet that has been given to you, is a statement by a Jew. He has, says some beautiful things against the Jews. As a Jew, he says, the last paragraph, and how strange, how strange, unusual, inexplicable, how strange, he says, I thought, as a Jew, I thought, that a nation which had suffered so many wrongs, a nation, the Jews, that had suffered so many wrongs, in the course of its long and sorrowful diaspora, dispersion, scattering, was now in single-minded pursuit of its own goal, ready to inflict a grievous wrong on another nation, and a nation too, that was innocent of all that past Jewish suffering. Such a phenomena, I knew, was not unknown to history. But it made me, nonetheless, very sad to see it enacted before my eyes. Now when I read that, that also made me cry. So I combined the two, the picture, and the statement by a Jew. And I say, I advertise this in my leading newspapers in my country, the Sunday Times, the Sunday Star. But the Jews got the wind of it, and they went and they clamped down on all the newspapers in the country. The Argus said, anti-Israeli advert, enrages Jews. Another one, Islamic advert, angers South African Jews. And they clamped down and they banged down upon all the newspapers not to publicize our advert. 
So in other words, we are giving battle to these forces. Now, we are giving out here in the Middle East that you, I want you to look at that picture. Give me a caption other than the one that's given. It says face of fear, what fear looks like. Look at the children, the faces. The children, the child, the mother, the girls. Picture of face of fear. I want you to give another caption and write in two to four hundred words your impression, your feelings about this. And the, f the best prize, the first prize, is entitled 1,000 KD, Kuwaiti Dinars, we give you. First prize. Second prize, 500 KD. Third prize, 250 KD. And five consolation prizes of 50 KDs each. What I want you to do, what I wanted the people to do, and what I want the people in America and England to do, is to think about this problem. See, this is the way of making them to think. Because in the newspaper, if you saw the picture, Mm, it says horrible, horrible. <laughs> and you want to see about football, and you see about the, uh, the uh, exchange rates for the dollar, and something else, and, and finish. It's forgotten. But if you look at this picture, because what is all this game about? What is this? I says, man, what is this guy is offering you 1,000 KD? For what? For this. So if you stay on this topic for a little while, it's going to have some... Ex some effect on you. And we expect this effect to be on the Christian and the Jew. And the Jews, when they saw this, they realized how potent this advert was. The only way was to gag us. They succeeded. But now, we are printing 150,000. We'll print a quarter million and give out in the streets. In other words, if the idea occurs to you, you are the man to do the job. My brother, he has certain ideas. I said, you are the man to do the job. Don't pass the buck on to somebody else. You know, it's time that we stop passing the buck.